Yes, let's give it up for our band leading us in worship. Oh, week three of Haunted. And for those of you that are guests with us, we went down to the most haunted house in America to shoot some footage for you guys to bring to life a concept of things that haunt us. And today we're going to be talking about a really easy one called the past. Many of us have a past that haunts us. We have some decisions that haunt us. We have some people that haunt us. Maybe even some words that were spoken to us. And, and a lot of times there's, there's a confidence that we lack because of the way we interpret the data that has gone into our lives. And today we're going to, to watch a clip in, in just a moment. Um, there, were, there were two places that we stayed on the property the first night. The first night we didn't have access to the entire house. And so Ben and I were staying um, up into the, the place that I talked about a couple weeks ago, this haunted room, um, in which you'll see in an extended webisode that something in our room mysteriously moved from one place to the other. It's going to be amazing, but we can't show that on Sundays because it take too long. But it'll be worth the watch this week. Um, but but uh, the rest of the guys were staying out in what we call the, the care, what they call the caretaker's quarters. And it's this uh, probably 800 square foot room with a shower and a bathroom. And it was actually built 200 years ago and was brought to that plantation 200 years ago to be a place for the caretaker. And, and uh, it was referred to by the staff on the grounds, of course, they're, you know, kind of ghost type people, this, as a, a place that the children like to play. And so, so the guys are, are sitting in this, this room and uh, little did they know when, when we went out and we saw the area, they had these big wooden shutters on the outside. And Ben Burbrick, the nicest guy on our staff, had an evil plan. He said, Tim, you see those shutters? I was like, yeah. He goes, I'm going to get those guys tonight. Sets his alarm for 4 o'clock in the morning. And he goes down there and <laughs> scares himself along the way. Great story. <laughs> we don't have time for it, but he was scared to go out there. And so it took a lot of courage to go where they were. And then he like subtly starts like bang, bang. And he can't. He can't hear anything. He's like, bam, like that. And what you're going to hear um, is an interview the next morning from Lucas describing what he feels like was an incident that happened that was somewhat paranormal. And so um, if, you would, if you would watch this with me. So last night we slept in this cabin called the, the caretaker's cabin. And it's dark. And we all got woken up by some noises, just these, these thud, 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 just these three loud bangs. And, and man, I'll tell you, I, I wanted to think that I would have probably gotten up to see what it was, but my first reaction was just to freeze. I just, like a little kid, I, I pulled the covers a little more over my face and just kind of buried my face into the pillow and turned the volume up on my phone so I couldn't hear the noises anymore. And man, I started thinking about it. I, I think if I could have just gotten up, gone outside, turned the lights on, and seen what was there or what wasn't there, I probably would have had enough peace to fall back asleep last night. But I froze, and I stood there and sat there and laid there in my fear, wondering what I just heard in that darkness. <laughs> Woo, I love it, love it. Um, I, just, I just wondered how many of us can relate to Lucas, that we got some things going on in our life, and instead of getting up and dealing with it and facing it, we have this tendency to pull the covers up over our heads, and we want to pretend that it's going to go away. That it's just going to fix itself. I wonder if there's anyone in the house that is a professional <clears throat> rug sweeper. Anybody, anybody in the house, that's the way you deal with problems? Anybody like to just, just sweep it under the rug? Anybody a closet stuffer? Anybody in the house? You just, just put more and more skeletons in that closet. And we believe that, that somehow, some way, that tomorrow it's going to be a better day. And your, 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 your style of fighting with your spouse 
is to just ignore the problem and like, oh, let's just agree that we're going we're gonna to go forward and you, you don't deal with it and that, that just pile of stuff is just getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Oh man, at some point we have to have the courage, the courage to get up and deal with stuff. I wonder if, I wonder if there's anyone in here that can relate to a moment in your life where you thought there was something that was dominating, a, a fate that was sealed like, like you thought because of something you did or you didn't do, you're, you have a lack of qualification. Today I'm going to do an interesting style. Usually kind of I, I build toward the, through the bad and I get to the good. Today we're going to go good, bad, good. And in the midst of this, I hope that I can give you some keys that can unlock the chains of your past. And, and in Romans chapter 8, let's start off with the good. And it's going to take some work because I'm going to tie a whole bunch of stuff together. We're going we're gonna to throw a bunch of stuff in the pot, and when it comes out, it's going to be jambalaya at the end, okay? It's going to smell good, it's going to taste good, but it's going to be a little disjointed in getting there. In Romans chapter 8, I want you to look at, at where, in my opinion, you should be. Now, it's probably not where you are, but this is where you should be. And so let's measure up to where you should be, okay? The Apostle Paul says, no, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So he says our ability to overcome is proportionate to, connected to, tied to the love that we receive from him. Therefore, the first admission that you're going to have to come to in order to get the confidence of a conqueror is that you need his love in your life. And some of you are so stoic, some of you are so hardened that you believe that if you harden yourself that it makes you impervious to the ability of pain and people's ability to hurt you. When really all you're doing is creating weakness. Weakness. You can never have the confidence of a conqueror until you have received the love of Christ. Can I get an amen right there? You've got you to understand something that if you go through life having never received what God is freely offering you that he paid for at the cross, then you'll never be confident in being a conqueror. He says, verse 38, for I am sure. Now listen to this. Verse. If you ever wanted a guarantee from God, here it is. Some of you live so insecure. And insecurity leads you to a lack of surety in your life. Here he says, I'm sure. For those of you that are living in here in insecurity, anxiety, then I hope that you'll listen to this verse. It's, it's so simple. It could radically change your life. He says, I'm sure. He's not, he's, he's not like ambivalent. He's not questioning. He says, I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's where the church said, amen. If you ever wanted a guarantee from God, that's it. He said nothing, nothing. And if I'm if reading it right, let's try to get really deep on this word. Nothing means nothing, all right? I mean, that's, that's deep, right? Nothing is able to separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus your Lord. Physical relationships, human relationships, you can make bad decisions that will destroy human relationships. Aren't you glad your spiritual connected isn't dependent on you? Aren't you glad that it's dependent on what Jesus did and not what you're going to do? Because if it was dependent on you, you'd be in trouble. Can I get an amen? Some of you, you already sinned this morning on your way to church. You already said something, did something. You know, you know who you are. You're sinners. Did something last night, trying to sleep it off today. I know, I know, okay. Don't act like you're spiritual in here. Some of you, you know. Here he says, I'm persuaded that nothing, if you walked around inside of the confidence that you are secure in Christ, do you think it would change your perception of the situation that you're in? Do you, do you think that you can't have confidence and be a conqueror and be insecure at the same time? They can't, they're mutually exclusive. They can't occupy the same ground. So this morning, if you are insecure and you're filled with anxiety, then there's an answer, and it's the love of God. 
It's the love of God that's in Christ. And so if you would change your perspective and receive what God is willing to give to you this morning, it would, it would move you and reposition you to take on life from a different perspective. Now, watch this. This is not the message I was going to preach this week. When we planned this series, this was not in the docket, all right? So we called an audible. Last week, we opened some closets that I didn't know we were going to open. We, we, we uncovered some people living in isolation that were hurting. And so much so, one of the stories that I loved, and I'm going to tell it this morning, I can't wait, I'm excited. One of our counselors, Pastor Tommy, pastor of our life group, let's give Tommy a hand, he's doing a great job, life groups, <laughs> men's Bible studies. He was up here on the stage, and we had so many people up here, we, we didn't have enough counselors, and I gave him the, the old, you know, eyeball, like, get down there, boy. And so he was like, woo, get down here, and a guy walked up to him. Right? God, now, so many things are at play. Number one, I had to be discerning in the spirit that we needed someone else down there. I knew someone else needed to come. Tommy had to be willing to be obedient. He went down there. And then someone walked up to him and he said, I just want to be made new. I just want to be made new. And he prayed to receive Christ right there, right there. That happened last week. He was telling me the story. I was like, man, that's the easiest clothes I ever heard of. I mean, I wish they were all like that. I wish everyone in here would quit being so spiritually stubborn that you would just come to the place that you agree with God that you just need to be made new. It's not, it's not that you need to change a little bit. You need to be made new. It's not that you just need to start getting faithful. You just need to start reading. You need to be made new. All right, we need a new you in order for you to not be haunted by the things of your past. And I believe, I believe if we would embrace Romans chapter 8, it would change. It would change our level of confidence. It would change our level of security. You see, and we're going to read a story today, and I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a, a lengthy story. But in Exodus 32, we're going to kind of now go down into the bad. And we're going to talk about what, what is it about our past that haunts us. And I, I'm just curious, has anybody ever done something in your past that you kind of think about still today. Anybody in here got something back there? Yeah, yeah. Some of it's not too far from you. I understand. It says that when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down, Moses is up on the mountain and he's getting the law. He's, he's getting a message from God. And God's people are so stubborn, so feeble, so frail, that when Moses delayed, they got insecure. And they decided that they were going to come up with their own plan. I'm just curious, as we get started and we start going down this road, the plan that you are currently employing for your life, your life plan. Some of you look at me like, Tim, I don't have a plan. Trust me, that plan is a plan. The plan of nothing is going to get you nowhere. Anyway, and so, so the, the plan that you are currently operating under, let me ask you a question. Is it your plan or is it God's plan? Is it your plan or is it God's plan? Because whenever you take your life and you say, I'm going to make up my plan, you are literally playing Russian roulette. You are spinning the cylinder and you're saying, I hope it ends on God. And I'm telling you, that's a terrible way to live. Wouldn't you rather have God's plan and the security of knowing that God was going to work it out, even when it looks like it's impossible, that if he promised, it's going to prevail? I'd rather have that than my own strength, my own wit, my own intellect, because I am finite and limited where he is infinite and limitless. So this morning, I want you to just ask yourself a simple question. The plan for your marriage right now the plan for your profession right now. Is it your plan? Or is it God's plan? Because when you take matters into your own hands, it is inevitable that you tend to drift. Here are the Israelites. Moses has been gone a couple of weeks. <laughs> and they start freaking out. And they say, Aaron, Aaron's in charge. Aaron is is dad while dad's away. You know what I'm saying? Aaron, make us a God. Make us a God. We need a God. Now you would think that they had a God, right? I mean, they just were fresh out of 400 years of slavery. 
the Red Sea parted. God followed with a pillar of cloud, a pillar of fire and a cloud during the day, and the enemy that had that had dominated them for 400 years was wiped out in a in a one stroke of God's hand with a wall of water. I mean, you would think that they had a God. You hear what I'm saying? But there's something about us, right? That is uncomfortable with the unknown. That incomplete information for some of us makes us very insecure. Is there anyone in here that likes to have all the details before you make a decision? Let's go ahead. Let's go therapy time, okay? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, you struggle with God then. Because every person I know that followed God, he didn't give them all the details. You say, now, well, how mean is God? He knows me. Yeah, exactly. He knows you. And your details are your way of controlling. And he's trying to teach you dependence. He's trying to teach you that there's a place that you can run to for strength when you don't know how it's going to end. When you don't have the detail. When the map ends and there's a question mark. That he has an answer for that. Here the Israelites make us a God. Aaron comes up with a plan. Terrible plan. Aaron says, give me all your gold, all your earrings. And uh, the guys and the girls had earrings, so I guess that destroys that old you know, thing where preachers like, I shouldn't be wearing earrings. That's for girls. Well, in the Bible they had earrings. Probably had tattoos too. Who knows? And so <laughs> I, I don't know why we get hung up on things that are on the outside. You know what God's concerned with? The things on the inside. So let's just get past all that trash, all right? And so anyway, and so they, they gather the earrings and they get the gold, they put it in the fire, and Aaron forges a calf, a golden calf. Now, where did they get the idea of worshiping a cow? Anybody know? Anybody know where they got that idea? It was their past. It was Egypt. That was one of the gods in Egypt. And the moment that they got insecure, they wanted something familiar. They wanted something they could touch. They, they wanted something they could see. And isn't it interesting? Whenever we get to a place where we struggle to make sense of something, we will embrace anything. Has anybody ever known this to be true? Like whenever you're struggling, you're like, well, I just don't understand it. Then we just start reaching and we want something familiar. And oftentimes we go running back to the things of our past to try to help us in the present. And the crazy thing is is that these things are dead. Why do we keep embracing the wrong things to lead us, to save us, to help us, to give us hope? I don't know why we do it, but I want to ask a question anyway. Has anyone in here ever embraced the wrong thing? Can I get an amen? If you've ever embraced the wrong thing, have you ever embraced the wrong person? Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Have you ever embraced the wrong job? You ever embraced the wrong boss? Have you ever embraced the wrong friend when things were going south? Why do we keep embracing wrong things? As a matter of fact, some of you can look back to the Rolodex of the pain that's in your life and you keep committing the same sin of putting your hope in wrong things. You see, those things are dead, those things are broken. They cannot help you. They cannot speak life into you. They cannot deliver you. They cannot give you purpose. They can't renew your passion. They can't give you grace for your guilt. They can't forgive your sins. And yet there's something sick about us that goes running back to the things that are familiar whenever we get into trouble. I'm going to preach. I'm going to preach today. I want to ask you, couple of things that I found that people might go running to in their past. Has anyone in here ever grabbed a bottle? And you believe if you could dive down into the bottom of that bottle somehow, it was going to make you feel better about what you were going through. Has anyone in here ever lit a burnt offering? And put something inside your lungs. 
And it used to be one thing, but now it could be a lot of things. But I'm just saying that you thought that it would somehow cure the anxiety that you're going through. Has anyone in here ever tried to heal the pain with a pill? Oh, man, we got so many pills today. There's a pill for everything. And it's legal, right? So it must be okay. Man, I, I bet if, if half of you would just try Jesus for 60 days without the pills, you'd be surprised at what Jesus could do. I'm not saying I'm against medicine of any kind. I'm just saying you should try Jesus first. You should try Jesus first. I wonder if anyone in here has ever starved themselves. Trying to find some ideal shape to try to find the approval of other people who don't even notice that you're doing it. I wonder if there's anybody that's ever crawled into bed with someone believing that a physical connection was going to heal the heartbroken person inside. Or trying to take all these misshapen things and place them in the void of our hearts. How about my escapist? Those were the serious ones. Now I can get a little bit funny to drag y'all out of that despair. Has anybody ever thought, if I could just get away for a week on a beach or a mountain, that I would just feel better about life? Anybody in here just thinking, man, I got to get to that vacation. Anybody, I just, I just need a week away. And when you get back, guess what's waiting on you? The same problems. The same people. Some of them are your children staring at you, right? <laughs> Has anybody ever fallen for the proverbial carrot dangling before the donkey, believing that if I could just get to that level, if I could just get to this size of business, if I could just get to this size of promotion, this size of house, if I could just get whatever it is, and you're perpetually struggling, and it's always out there in front of you, and you've never arrived at it yet because you're putting your faith in false things. Man. Has anyone ever spent money that you don't have to buy something you didn't need so that you would feel better about yourself right now? Anybody retail therapy? Can I get an amen for retail therapy? Man, if I just buy some new clothes, I feel better about it. If I just get a new ride, I feel better. If I just get a different house, I'll feel better about it. Oh, my gosh. Why do we believe superstitiously that these dead things, these habits, these rituals can somehow lead to life. As a matter of fact, the Israelites, let's look at this verse. This, this verse, this verse kind of like jarred me. I never had seen this verse in this light. Put up verse four. So when they received the calf out of the fire, they had a quote they attributed to it. Watch, look at this. Look at this. The, the people that wanted the calf Aaron made it, it came out, they said to all the people, these are the gods, O Israel, that brought you out. The, have you lost your mind? I'm telling somebody here, you heard that. That sermon was for you right there. Have you lost your ever-loving mind that you somehow have taken the glory of God that delivered you out of your worst pit of despair and now are attributing your affection and the, the, the glory and the, the, the credit to something else, to someone else, to even maybe yourself. Do you forget how did you get here today? If it weren't for the grace of God, you wouldn't be here. Can I get an amen? Quit giving God's glory to dead things. Quit. It blows my mind if I were God, right? God says, to Moses. He's up there talking. With, he doesn't even know. He doesn't even know. He, these people down there, I mean, they went crazy. I can't even get to the level that they were at in here this morning in mixed company and with children. But let's just say that when it was all said and done, people didn't have any clothes on and they were running around out of breath. Okay. So, so crazy things were going on while Moses was on the mountain. And he says to Moses, God says to Moses, you need to get down there because the people have lost their minds. As a matter of fact, I think we should just destroy them and start over with you. 
Now, Moses has already experienced the stubbornness of these people. And if I were Moses, I think I'd have been like, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. I don't like most of them. They don't listen. They don't follow. Let's just start over with me, God. I mean, Moses had the wherewithal to say, God, if you do that, then the, the world, the audience, is going to say you led your people out here just to destroy them. And God relented. Now here's where the story gets interesting. Moses goes down, and he says, Aaron, what have you done? What have you done? Aaron said, you know these people. You know, they complained. I made some, put some gold in the fire, out jumped a calf. And so he's like, he's like, he's a little bit, a little bit disingenuous with the story. And God says, Moses, you need to handle this. Moses draws a line in the sand. And he says, who is on the Lord's side? Verse 26, who is on the Lord's side? And the Levites gathered around him. Now, now, I know that you don't know what I'm getting ready to say. I know you don't know. The Levites, as we know them looking back, were the people that ministered in the tabernacle and in the temple, those that were closest to God. But that was decided on this day. That was not their permanent faith and fate going back in the time machine. Now, this is where it's going to get a little disjointed. I need to go back in the biblical time machine to get y'all up to, to, to pace on what's happening right here because here's point number two. Crazy problems create incredible crossroads. Crazy problems create incredible crossroads. When you are having the craziest problem in your life, and somebody in the house said amen. When you're having the craziest problem in your life, it creates an incredible crossroad of what are you going to do. If we go back in the time machine, after Abraham had Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob had a brother named Esau, and Jacob tricked his brother out of his birthright, and all the women at retreat know about old Leah and Rachel. Can I get an amen from the ladies in the house? Yes, 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 yes. Crazy story, because after uh, Jacob was tricking his brother, and, and his mom, it, it runs in the family, led him to trick his father, and then his uncle tricked him, and then when he had children, they sold his son into slavery. I mean, it runs in the family. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And a crazy thing happened. While Joseph was gone down to Egypt, the, the Jacob's family, the Israelites, all of his 11 other children, they, they got close to this one group, and, and they had a sister named Dinah. And Dinah was, was raped. And Jacob... He kind of shrugged it off because it was Leah's kids. And Rachel was his first love. Man, whenever you introduce alternatives to God's plan, it creates difficulty. Anybody in a broken home say amen to difficulty with brokenness inside that? Yes. Man, it's hard to love other kids like they're your own. It's hard. It's, hard. it's not impossible. There's a place that we can go, but you're not going to find it on this earth. You can only go to the throne of heaven to find, find grace like that because God has adopted you all. He knows how to love like that. Amen. <laughs> can I get it? Yeah, that's good. And so here is Jacob, and Dinah is raped, and he, he doesn't, he doesn't want to deal with it. And so he shrugs it off because he knows that if he deals with it, it's going to lead to war. And he's a little uncertain of what the outcome's going to be. So Dinah had two brothers, Simeon and Levi. And they said, okay, okay, we'll take matters into our own hands. They said, you can make this right in their culture if you married the person, which I know, archaic, crazy, don't get hung up on that point for right now. If you marry her, it redeems her. So they said to all of the Hittites that you all have to be circumcised as grown men. You're going to find the sense of humor in this. 
and then we'll let you marry into the family. So they waited until all the men were feeling the effects of a grown man circumcision. I will let all the guys be uncomfortable at this juncture. This is the Bible, folks. It doesn't get any rawer than this. I'm just preaching what it says, okay? It says they waited until they were sore, and then they went in and they cut them all down. Killed them all. Killed, you raped our sister? Killed every last one of them. Jacob now has to leave the country they're in because he knows that the other people are going to want war with them because they're going to think they're trying to kill everybody. On the way to their next stop, his wife, the love of his life, Rachel, doesn't make it. She dies. And wrapped up in all this pain and suffering, Jacob's kids, he's frustrated with them because they're just like Jacob. You see what I'm saying? Do you ever get frustrated with you and your children? Can I get an amen? When you see what they do, you see you, and you drive, it's like it drives you crazy because they're just like you. Man, Leah, Rachel, blended family, messed up. Can I just tell all the guys in here, one woman is enough for you. You don't need to. Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen from the brothers in the house? One woman is enough. You can't handle two. You can't. You can't. Here is, is Jacob now at the end of his life. They've gone down to Egypt. They've been reunited with Joseph. And it comes to the end and he's on his deathbed, sick unto death, getting ready to die. And all the children come before him for their blessing, all 12 children. And it says when he got to Simeon and Levi, instead of blessing them, he cursed them. If you're taking notes, read it, Genesis 49. He cursed them. He said, you want to know what your inheritance is? Nothing. You cut down those men with malice and evil in your heart, and your reward for your anger and for your violence is nothing. For 400 years, they were in Egypt. The Levites, the Naphtalites, Dan, all the tribes. And the Levites were under a curse. When they get to this moment now, fast forwarding in time, they've crossed the Red Sea, and now they've built a golden calf. God has said, Moses, go deal with it. Moses draws a line in the sand, and he says, I just want to know one question. Who is on the Lord's side? And you would have thought that Joseph's people would have come running up, or Judah, the line of Jesus, would have come running and getting in line, or Benjamin, who all the kings were going to come from Benjamin's line. You would have think that would have been, but here come the Levites. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? The Levites line up around Moses. And Moses says, kill everyone who is against God, whether it is your family, whether it's your brother, whether it's your son, anybody that is rebelling against God, this is God's word, this is God's will, take them out. And the Levites go to work. And it says in the last verse, watch this, it says today, today, watch this, verse 29, today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord. Today. So what you did today changed something in your past. Now here, here oh my gosh, this is going to get good now. Crazy problems create incredible crossroads. Are you going to surrender to following in your earthly father's footsteps and all of his proclivities and all the things that he did that he shouldn't have done. And now that you're getting old enough, you're starting to see yourself in your father and you're seeing, you see your father in yourself and your mother in yourself and the things that they did wrong, you are slowly following in their footsteps. When they got divorced, you're moving toward the edge. Maybe you've already been through the first divorce and now you're headed toward the second and, and you begin to feel in your life that you are cursed. You see, if you were a Levite, your dad and your granddad and your great-granddad were all cursed 
by their earthly father. Nothing. And now, out of this crazy problem of rebellion, there's a crossroads, an opportunity to make a decision that is going to be a generational change. The ability to break a curse that had bound them for 400 years years. And so the question I want to ask you, are you the result of chance or choice? Are you the result of chance or choice? Some of you believe that you are the way you are because that's the way your parents were, that's the way your granddad was, and when you look in your life, you see broken home, and so you repeat the process because you say, that's just in my DNA, that's the way my dad did, he ran around on my mom, and so I guess I'm just doomed to run around on my wife. And we follow in our earthly father's footsteps, and and some of you believe something that someone said about you a long time ago, they cursed you, they spoke of what you couldn't be. And those words echo in your brain. It doesn't matter what anybody else says, you still hear their voice. Do you think that could haunt anybody this morning? Do you think it's possible for God to redeem what Jacob cursed? Do you think it's possible that you could create a generational change in your family? Because here's the the crazy thing. Some people are born connected to blessing. My wife, bless her soul, born into a pastor's house. She's born into a blessing, raised in a blessing. And I thank God that she was because she knows how to be a mom. She knows how to love. She knows how to be godly. I didn't have to teach her any of that. Some of you were born into a blessing, but some of you, you were born under a curse. Some of you had to fight to obtain the blessing that you have. Some of you never had the Father to show you. Some of you never had the Dad to show you how to be the husband. Show you how to shave. Teach you how to be a man that stands up and takes responsibility for himself. Teaches you the value of taking care of your stuff versus just treating everything like trash. Some of you never had the dad that walked you down the aisle, so you had to get someone else to stand in his stead. Some of you looked at other children. And you yearned for that family life because you never knew what that was like. Here was Levites, born under a curse, lived under a curse, and now all of a sudden, there was a moment. And the question is, when your moment arises, which could be this very morning, the moment when you could say, I want to be made new, Are you going to sit there in your pride? Are you going to sit there in your fear? Pull your covers over your head. Are you going to rise, meet your moment, and say, it's not as settled as it seems to be. The Levites heard Moses say, who is on the Lord's side? And though I was born under a curse in this moment, I have a chance to change my fate. And they say, we are on 
the Lord's side. And they took up a sword, and they were willing to fight to obtain a blessing that they weren't born under, and they were able to change their fate. They went from the worst to the people that were the worship leaders of the Israelites, the closest to the presence of God. You see, some of you believe it's chance. It's all the things that you didn't have or all the things that happened to you that have led you to this moment, and you've surrendered your fate. What if I told you this morning that God could change it this morning? If you said yes, if you made the decision this morning to be on the Lord's side, it could all change this morning. It's not as settled as some think that it is. When David went out into the valley, all the soldiers sitting on the sidelines thought that it was settled what the outcome would be. When Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, all the critics thought that it was settled on what the outcome would be. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace, all of the people that had trumped up the charges against them thought that it was settled what the outcome would be. When Jesus met the woman in John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman, and she had been married five times, and the relationship that she was in at that juncture was with someone else's husband, everybody in her community thought that it was settled what she was. Oh, but Jesus. Oh, but Jesus stepped in. You see, some of you are haunted by your past, but we could change it. We could change it this morning. I think about the crossroads. It's not as settled as some think that it is. I'm pretty sure when the Roman soldiers beat my Jesus and whipped him, and mocked him and crowned him with a crown of thorns and led him up to a place called Calvary and drove three hands into his feet and hands. I'm pretty sure when they put the spear in his side and all of his blood spilled on the ground and when they took his lifeless body down from the cross, I'm pretty sure that they thought the outcome was settled. But I'm so glad that there was a third day. The first day and the second day, the disciples were just like the Israelites. They said, we're going to go back to our past. Peter said, I'm going back to fishing. But then on the third day, Jesus got up by his own power. It says he folded the clothes in the tomb. Are you kidding me? How awesome and cool is Jesus? He's like, I'm not even in a hurry. I've been waiting on this for eternity. He's like, oh, some of you want a husband more like Jesus. He's folding it up and he puts it right there. And then rolls the stone back, and he walks out in and of his own power. It's not as settled as some think that it is. If he can overcome death, what is your problem? If you are walking in insecurity, if you are uncomfortable with the unknown, I return to where I began. I am persuaded that neither Angels, nor principality, nor things present, nor things to come, neither height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus my Lord. I'm standing on that today. That's the truth that I'm standing on, that the father and mother that I didn't have didn't make me bad. It made me better. The adversity that I had to fight to obtain the blessing of being called into the ministry and creating a church like this, that, that I respect it, that I would fight to the death for it because I didn't have any of that growing up. But God was what I didn't have, and God gave me what I had never experienced. And now I can give something to my kids, and they'll never be like what I came from. And that is the glory of God this morning. That's your choice. That's your choice. You are not a product of chance. You are a product of choice. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I take away all of the th things that people are leaning on this morning that are preventing them from change. I know what happened was terrible. I'm not excusing what someone said to you how they cursed you. I'm not excusing what someone did to you when they raped you. I'm not excusing 
that mom and dad divorced and somehow you thought that you were responsible. I'm not excusing any of that pain. What I am saying is that God's going to give you a moment that if you would choose to be on His side, He can take it and transform it and use it as a testimony of His glory. It's your choice this morning. It's your, your marriage is your choice. Your love is your choice. Your forgiveness is your choice. How it's going to be for your marriage in the future. Listen to me, all the young people in the house. If you would decide today to sow godly decisions, you could break the curse that's in your family. They never have to feel what you felt. But you got to make that decision now. It's not a decision you make when you grow up. It's a decision that you make today. For all the people that are walking toward the end of a relationship, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would get over yourself, that you would run to the cross, and you would say, God, I need you to make it new. For my lost person that's sitting in here this morning, having never accepted Christ. I just ask you, I beg you, don't you think the confidence of the love of God can change your life for all of eternity? Oh, if you say, is he talking to me? Yeah, I'm talking to you. Don't even question, I'm talking to you. I'm going to ask our counselors to come up this morning. We want to make them available because I believe Someone needs to get set free from the curse. Someone needs to pray for their marriage and get set free from the curse. Three generations of broken families. How are you going to beat the curse? It's the cross. In Colossians 2, it says that Jesus took the penalty of our sin and he canceled our debt and he nailed it to the cross. He crucified your curse so that he could set you free. He canceled your debt so that you wouldn't owe anything, that your guilt could be taken away. You don't have to pay for it anymore if you would just choose grace this morning. Would you stand and run to the altar for change this morning?